between the church and the school here at King of Glory. So mine is going to focus a little bit on um, what we do in the classrooms here. Um, so I wanted to start, um, here's a picture of me, but I'm on the video, so we can move past that. Um, but before I go into what we're doing in the classroom, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of a background as far as what kind of program that we have. So our program starts with two and a half year olds, and we go up through kindergarten. Um, our preschool program without the kindergarten has been around for about 12 years, and our kindergarten was added approximately four years ago. Um, and it's kind of gone up and down. We've had very good enrollment years, and we've had some that are that are kind of okay, not bad, but certainly not as high as we would like them. This year we have 17 in our, pre in our kindergarten classroom, um, so that's a, a real blessing to us. Um, our program has been um, a part of King of Glory um, for several years, and as we talked about a little bit last week, we're all connected together through the mission of um, King of Glory Lutheran Church. And so we really strive to, um, to talk to each other, to support each other, and that support in our preschool is absolutely amazing. Um, it's so good for everybody involved. It's good for the teachers. It's good for the families. It's a, a place where they can come um, if they're having any struggles, any personal issues that are going on. And that support that we have from the church just gives me as the director such a wealth of knowledge to go to um, to help these families. Now, as far as I go, I've been the director for exactly one week. <laughs> so it might seem a little strange that I'm already doing this uh, webinar. But I um, have been a part of King of Glory's preschool for about six years now. I worked in the classroom. I worked in the office. I actually helped with the exemplary status um, paperwork last year. So I've been involved with it for, for quite a while. Um, but I'm a relatively new director here. So with our mission, uh, we try to look at this as our guiding force throughout the preschool as well. And so when we are putting together programs for families or we're putting together curriculum changes, we always go back to this mission of the church. And in the way that I'm going to talk about how we celebrate every child, um, I want to look at it in a couple of different areas. One is curriculum, um, one is growth, and that's growth in lots of different terms that I'll talk about, and one is intentionality um, and being very intentional about what we do with our children, both in our curriculum decisions as well as in their everyday life here at our preschool. So to start off with our curriculum excellence, uh, we really strive here to meet the highest of quality in early childhood education. So uh, we are NACI accredited, and that stands for the National Education National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, sometimes hard to say, but um, that's a nationally recognized program, and they come in and evaluate what we do um, on a curriculum basis in our program um, and give us the... Um, the honor of being accredited through their organization. Um, if any of you have ever gone through that process or even looked at it, it is an amazingly uh, rigorous program to go through. There's many, many, and I've lost track. I used to know exactly how many criteria they had that you have to meet, um, but there's hundreds of them, and it goes from everything from what's going on in the classroom to how your parent handbook is set up. Um, but we really wanted to um, show in our community that we are dedicated to the education of young children and being the best that we can be. Um, as a part of that, and I see a mistake on my PowerPoint, it's not start quality, it's star quality. Um, our, our Virginia area, and I'm sure there's lots of you who have this in your um, own areas and states, the STAR Quality Program um, comes in and does something similar to NACI, but using different kinds of criteria. It's still, of course, looking at the highest quality of early childhood education. Um, and it, they, they have things organized a little bit differently, but they come in and do an observation, and then they actually provide mentoring um, in 
uh, the classroom or within the office. So if you're having some issues with setting up um, your, your office in order to be the best organized, the best, best, most supportive to families and to teachers, you can use your mentor to help you with that, or you can use your mentor to help you in classrooms. So for instance, just last week, my mentor happened to be here, and we were having an issue with a little boy in one of our three-year-old classes, and I had her go in and just spend half an hour in there and talk to the teachers. And it's just so nice to have that as a resource. And so um, we have gone, we have um, completed that program in the middle of that as well. Um, and our, the curriculum program that we use here at King of Glory is called Creative Curriculum. That is by Diane Trister Dodge. And um, she's been in early childhood for many, many years. Um, and Creative Curriculum is really a program where um, we look at how the environment is set up, how our parents are involved in our preschool programs, um, and how we have set up our lessons in order to best meet the needs of every child on their own level. And meeting the child at their level is really what we're all about here. We want to find out where they are, not only um, developmentally, but also in their home life, and work with them and their families as partners to move forward. Um, one thing that Pastor Harmon mentioned last week is that we've started a um, service specifically for parents and children. And one of the things that he says about that service is that um, we want to be partners with families because we understand that in their children's spiritual life, they're the number one predictor of, of how that's going to go. Um, and that's true in all of education. <laughs> so we as teachers and um, schools are a part of children's lives for such a small amount of time that we want to have a recognition that if we can help parents learn and help parents understand um, how their children grow and develop, we can truly help affect children um, in, in the grander scheme of things. Um, I forgot to mention, but want to pause for just a moment. If anybody has any questions, go, feel free to go ahead and type them into that chat window, and I'll try to answer them as I go. I know things come up as we're talking, and I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask things as we're talking through this. Um, within our um, curriculum, we have a child-directed program. Um, so that means we take into account the children's learning styles, their personality, their developmental levels. Um, we want to challenge them in all different areas of the classroom. So we have different stations set up in our rooms or centers, if you will. Um, and we have a variety of things set up in those centers. So you see in the pictures, the one in the middle is of a little girl with goggles on, protective goggles, and a hammer in her hand. And she's hammering in golf tees into styrofoam. So it's not super dangerous. Of course, we have a teacher there with her at all times. Um, but we want to really challenge them um, to use those fine motor skills and to use that hand-eye coordination that she's using and to make it exciting and fun for them. Um, you see another little girl to the left of that picture, um, if you're looking at it, writing her name on a, on a piece of artwork that she's done. Um, and that's Ainsley. She was actually in my room a couple years ago. And um, she, is, she has worked really, really hard. It started off with just doing the A. And so we want to give children the opportunity to do things in the classroom in a meaningful way. So we don't want to sit and just say, you know, we're going to write the letter A today. We want to make it meaningful to Ainsley. Um, and we want to make it meaningful to Max. So Max, whose name starts with an M, um, doesn't care so much about the letter A. He cares about the letter M. So we want to be able to introduce things at their own developmental levels at the time that they're interested in learning about it. Um, and in that, we are really conscious of paying attention to which level these children are at. And we do lots and lots and lots of small group activities with them, um, such as the little girl with the hearts. That's a patterning activity. So she has a large purple, small purple, large pink, small pink, large purple, small purple. Um, so we can tell where she's at in that learning cycle of learning about a particular concept. And we do that with all of the concepts um, in our classrooms. Um, another thing that we do overall is our um, enrichment programs. So not only do we have the curriculum happening in the classroom itself, 
We also have some other programs that come in primarily for our older children, pre-K and kindergarten. Um, we have Spanish class, art class, um, physical education class. Uh, we have these classes as part of our weekly studies in those classrooms. The main reason we do it in pre-K and kindergarten is that those are the only children at King of Glory that are here five days a week. The, some of the other children, there are some four-year-olds who are only here two days a week. So if we added all of these other classes to their day, it would be too much. Um, it would be too much of a teacher-directed sort of time as opposed to a child-directed time. So we want to balance that part of it out. So we offer these classes primarily to the pre-K and kindergarten class. We do have music class for the younger children that's on an every other week basis. Um, the next part that I want to talk about is um, the growth part. And I mean growth in the sense of it affecting the school, the curriculum, and the child. And it all starts with the portfolio system that we use. So we use a system to track development on every single child in our classrooms. This is the uh, system that we've used. However, there's lots of them out, out there. Um, Creative Curriculum actually has a system, um, but it's an online system, and it was a little bit, um, it was a little challenging for some of my teachers who weren't quite as computer savvy. So we went with this one. So this is, it's called Pocket, and it's Preschool Observation Checklist and Evaluation Tool. And um, as I was talking, all of this kind of goes together. So we assess the children, which feeds into our curriculum, which feeds into documenting what the children can do, and feeds back into assessment. So we, we document the children, we assess them, we use that information to assess our curriculum, and we also use our curriculum to help document and assess. So it, it really is all interconnected in what we're doing every day um, in the classroom. This is what um, Pocket looks like, and I know it's a little overwhelming to see, um, and it's a little small, but it's organized in different subject matters. So we have literacy, language, math, approaches to learning, social, emotional, science, and physical. And to use one of those as an example, this is kind of what it looks like when it's blown up. So this is the language section. When you look at the black the, the, the words that are in black, those different criterias are observational assessment. So our teachers observe those in a classroom. Um, so they're looking in a classroom on whether a child follows directions. They're going to look to see if they're following just one-step directions or three-step directions, and they will document that in a different kind of way. It could be by a picture. It could be by an activity that they can show. It could also be just a written documentation as to what they have observed. And then the red pieces, the red parts down here, the red questions, are the direct assessment items. And what we do with the direct assessment is we actually sit down one-on-one -on -one with the child, and this is in a classroom, and one of my teachers doing it just last week. Um, we sit down one-on-one -on -one and we look at all of these red pieces. And the red questions, I would say, I should have counted them, but there's probably 20 um, of these red questions that they have, and some of them are, are meant to be simpler. So we have, what is your full name? How old are you? Um, and then it moves all the way up to um, phonetic sounds, um, learning, uh, knowing how many alphabet letters that they know, um, shapes, even concepts such as one-to-one -one correspondence um, and the idea of greater than and less than, um, which is always a tough one um, in, in working with three-year-olds. I've had very few children who can get some of those harder ones correct. But this assessment tool is really meant to go from three years old all the way through, um, uh, all the way through kindergarten. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the questions. Um, the first question was, what is your child to student ratio? That depends on the classroom that the, that the children are in. In our three-year-old class, it's a one to um, seven ratio. So we have 14 children in there um, and two adults. We have a, a lead teacher and then an assistant teacher. So the lead teacher has the responsibility of doing most of the assessments. Um, of course, they can use their assistant teacher to say, I used to give my assistant teacher um, different things that I wanted her to take pictures of, or a particular activity, like a graphing activity, and say, when the children are doing this, write this stuff down um, for me. 
<clears throat> and yes, all of this is Pocket that I'm talking about right now. So it's all within the context of Pocket. Um, okay, so what we do when we do assess them, and we only, we, we do the formal, um, the, the um, I forget what I called it, <laughs> sorry, the direct assessment items, we do those um, twice a year. So we do it in the fall, fairly close to the beginning of school, around October. We start the first week in, in September. So we try to do it within the first six weeks of school. And then we do it again in the spring. Now, let's say, for instance, you have a child who gets all of these, and I hesitate to use this word, but correct. So they have, they, they have answered these questions in the way in which Pocket says they should. So they tell you what their first and last name is. We do not reassess that in the spring. So if we make an assumption that if they know 15 alphabet letters in the fall, they'll know 15 alphabet letters in the spring, if not more. And so that meets the criteria, which is 10 alphabet letters. So we don't reassess things that we already have a good baseline on, if that um, helps to understand. I know there's always an issue as far as timing and taking time um, from the teacher, what the teacher is doing on an everyday basis. Um, the assessment time is one-on-one, -on -one, and that leads to its own group of issues. Um, one issue is that some children, when you're talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, are a little bit shyer. I've had kids who have sat down with me to do an assessment and literally will not talk. <laughs> and I know they can talk, and I know they can count, um, but they just won't. And so I just talk to the parents and say, you know, I sat down with Lucy, and Lucy just didn't want to participate in this, so I'm going to do it again in the spring. Um, typically in the spring, the ones of those that were in the fall that didn't want to do it will then do it again in the spring. But um, the lead teacher is the one who does this, which I already mentioned. And we try to do it in the most relaxed way that we possibly can. I picked this particular picture because the little girl has a cape on. Um, and so I wanted to show that we really, we try not to make a big deal about this. I used to call it playing games. Um, because a lot of the things seem like they're games. You know, we hand them a book and say, where's the front cover of this book? So we really try to make it as casual um, and non-threatening as we possibly can. Um, we want, first, of course, we want to do that for the best interest of the children, but also for the assessment, because if they're nervous or scared, um, we're not going to get a very accurate assessment. Um, now to go back for just a second, let's see, how do I go back one more? Here we go. So as we're doing this assessment, we can also say, okay, we need to change our curriculum because I've assessed all 14 of my three-year-olds and none of them know their first and last name. So we need to re-look at that in our classroom and maybe plan some activities to help them with that skill. Now some things you can't really help with. You know, it's just things that they're going to get eventually with a lot of exposure to it. Um, but what the what the hope is, is that we'll use these assessments to help guide our curriculum and our lessons in our classroom. Um, this is another picture. This is some of the direct, uh, direct assessment pages. Um, on this one, you can see that it's the um, it's shapes. And on this one, um, this is one of our alphabet pages, which this is only half the alphabet, and there's another page. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this one is about um, similarities in pictures. Um, so you would say, there's two cats in, the, in this picture. Can you tell me some things that are, that are similar in, with these two? And the kids typically say the sun or the ball of yarn is the same color or the flowers. Or, um, so there's lots of different things that they can say. Um, in the pocket book that we have, um, in the assessment book, which the teacher is actually using, she didn't pull pages out. You can see there's a binder here. Um, it actually tells you exactly what to say. So if you're a new teacher or you're not familiar with Pocket, you can go to those kind of prompts that they have written and it will say, whatever, <laughs> put out five blocks and say to the child, can you count these for me? Um, whatever the, the uh, goal is for that particular assessment item, it, they'll give you some ideas on the language to use with it. Now we've used this, I'm, I think we're going on our fourth year, so most of our teachers have that part of it down. But I still went back and looked every now and then just to say, okay, how was I, how was I supposed to say that? Um, and then on the other pieces, kind of going back to this, 
on these pieces up here that are in black and the teachers are just observing these in the classroom, um, this is kind of what our form looks like. So you can see the line down the middle of this. And on the right hand side, this is one of our um, documentation pages of something that we would just document. So the numbers that are here correspond back to the pocket numbers here. Um, I'm sure that's as clear as mud <laughs> to some of you. But um, it's hard to show, of course, on a PowerPoint. But this goes, so we're looking at a particular skill. Um, this one, I believe, has to do with counting, because you can see as she's pointing, she's counting up this block. And then what she's doing is she is um, hypothesizing on whether or not the egg that she has in her hand, that's a hard-boiled egg, will crack if it falls off of the blocks that are this high. So there are multiple things that this child's doing in this one picture. Um, there's science, there's language, there's counting, there's, um, there's all kinds of things that we can document on this. So you can see I documented two different items in one picture because um, you can do that. Um, and a lot of times we would set different projects up that would hit on different items so that we could make sure that we got to all of them. Because going back to that very first page that looks very overwhelming, <laughs> there are a lot of items on there. And so you really have to, as a teacher, break it down and say, we're going to look at whatever this week. Um, and then we'll move on to something different next week. So you really have to do it somewhat methodically. Um, are there any questions about that assessment piece? I don't see anybody typing. Um, in the Oh, somebody is. As they're typing, um, in the end, what we do is we have an entire portfolio that we show to the parents that include, you know, <laughs> 25 to 30 pages like this, as well as the results of, um, of the assessments that we've done. And we share those with parents at our spring and um, fall conferences. This is not from Creative Curriculum, this particular pocket um, portfolio program that we use is not directed from Creative Curriculum. Creative Curriculum does one, um, but it's, not, it's all online. Theirs is completely online. So you would take pictures and you would upload them to their forms and do that. Um, the pictures that you see, we add. I actually developed the form to use. You could certainly use a different kind of form, um, and you can kind of tailor make it to whatever it is you want it to be. <clears throat> you wouldn't even necessarily have to use the, the visual documentation. Some um, of the criteria don't lend themselves to pictures, so you just write what you observed um, within the classroom. Um, and then some of them do, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I always used pictures as much as I possibly could when I was putting my portfolios together. But the portfolio is really meant to provide an entire picture of the child to the parent who isn't there during the day. And I mentioned that piece of involving parents and having them understand how their child develops. All of this is, is used as a learning tool for parents. Um, so when they think their children should know every single alphabet letter and how to sound out words when they're three, I can show them something that isn't me, that's something that someone else, you know, presented, um, that shows that really this is a skill that they aren't expected to learn developmentally yet. So we can use that as a, as a learning tool for parents as well. Um, some of the documents are um, reproducible in the kit. Um, we actually bought one of the, um, if, if I go back to that original picture of the pocket, um, this. Um, this, you can, we purchased this whole entire kit, which involved the, um, it has the book that you saw the teacher working with the child on, as well as the actual um, checklist that we have. You can also just buy the checklist and look through the checklist and see what kinds of things you can put together to make your own pocket, um, you know, kind of kit. The, um, we bought all of these for every classroom, not every teacher. So we have some teachers that share a classroom. They also share the pocket information. Um, but then we also, we do buy the, um, 
the checklist for every child every year. So we use this form for one year and then we give them another one the next year. Um, we actually keep track of the results. Um, so this is a duplicate copy. So the parents get one and we keep one in their file. The parents get one at um, this fall conference, one at the spring conference, and then we keep one. This does move with the child from, um, from classroom to classroom. So if you have a child in the three-year-old room, their pocket form will go to the four-year-old teacher. Again, connecting it back to curriculum so that the four-year-old teacher can look through all of these pocket forms and say, oh, wow, the kids really need some help in this particular area, um, and then kind of help to guide that curriculum in her personal classroom. Um, do we keep the photos separate from the checklist? Um, kind of. Um, the checklist is just this form. And um, let me see if I <coughs> On here, we're actually checking what the information is. So this is fall, winter, and spring. Here at King of Glory, we only use fall and spring. We do not do a winter, a separate winter assessment. Um, so this is the actual checklist. The forms that we have that look like this um, all go together, but they're kind of separate, you know, in their physicality. Um, <laughs> they connect together. So this, this particular um, documentation sheet is going to connect back to one of these checklist items. I'm, I hope I'm making sense in all of this. Um, the, I, don't re I have no idea how much the kit is. <laughs> it's on discount school supply, things I should have looked up before I started the webinar. But um, I didn't even think to look that up for you. Uh, but it is on discount school supplies website. Um, that's where we got those. Anything else that I'm leaving out? OK. So all of this, as I said, connects back together to the classroom. We use these things in the classroom to set up what we're doing. We also do some things and then see how they've turned out on our assessment pages. Um, it goes everywhere from um, these kinds of items that I've kind of focused on, like literacy and math, <clears throat> to social emotional items, um, how the children get along together. Um, what they um, know about themselves, um, if they can represent their family in words, that sort of thing that they're looking at. To science, science and math are very similar on the checklist as far as it starts out really just wanting the children to be able to manipulate science materials. So you could take a picture of a child playing with a magnifying glass. You know, it, it can be very simple sorts of documentation. Two, you know, they understand one-to-one -one correspondence. <coughs> I apologize for coughing so much. Um, and then uh, the physical one, it um, involves fine motor and large motor skills. Those are probably the easiest to document um, because they're happening all the time. So we take our cameras outside. The one thing in doing this, all of my classrooms have cameras. Now, we've gotten those cameras through, <laughs> like, the... Um, uh, the clip things that you get from cereal boxes and stuff, we add those points up and buy cameras with that, or Campbell's soup label points, um, scholastic points. We use all of those sort of extra um, things that we have to buy cameras. Um, and we have to replace those fairly often, I mean, within every three years probably, just because they're used every single day a lot. Um, as well as you have to think about having in your um, ability to print off all of these pictures. Um, so we just actually renegotiated our contract with our um, copier group because we were printing so many color copies. Um, so there's a couple other things to kind of think about as you're, as you're thinking about um, doing a portfolio assessment. Um, okay. I see somebody else is writing, so before I move on to my next part, I'll see what they're saying. Oh, they're still writing. Okay, I'll keep talking, and then um, <laughs> I'll go back to it if it has to do with assessment. 
the next part that I that I wanted to talk about um, is intentionality in our classrooms and what we do in order to celebrate every single child throughout the year. And a lot of these things, when people come to see our program, it, they feel as though, hopefully, <laughs> they feel as though they're just part of our everyday experiences and that they're really easy and we've kind of put them in for fun. Um, but in reality, we've done a lot of thinking about why it is we're doing this and what we're trying to um, communicate with the child and develop as the culture of our school. So a great example of this is prayers done by students to close Bible story time. So we have Bible story time every day. It's one of the first things that we do from the classroom. And um, at the end of our Bible story, we have children saying the prayer to close it. Um, and it didn't used to be that way. It used to be that the teachers would close with a prayer or close with a song or however they kind of chose to close it. But in involving the children, we're teaching them um, how to pray. A lot of them have no idea. They, they don't even know how to begin. And so a lot of times, you know, as teachers, we're sit standing off to the side going, do you remember how to start? You know, whispering in their little ears. Do you remember what to say next? And at the end, we say, amen. And so we really are um, working with them in order to give them those foundations. And of a huge amount of time, we hear from the families that their children are praying at home, that they're praying before meals, that they're praying when something happens, because they are getting that information, that foundation from us. Okay, so somebody just asked another question. Um, and it says, I'm not familiar with creative curriculum. How did we choose it versus a Christian curriculum? Um, did you write your own Christian lessons to add to it? We do, um, our Christian values are a part of everything that we do within the day, which talks a little bit, speaks a little bit to that intentionality. So we intentionally involve um, prayers at multiple times during the day. We intentionally do chapel twice a month. We do lots of things that the music program that we bring in is a Christian-based teacher who does um, Christian songs. So we really want to make sure that they're hearing about um, Jesus and his love for them and their love for him um, over and over and over throughout the day. Um, you know, I don't actually have the historical information as far as why creative curriculum was chosen versus any other kind of curriculum. Um, just because I wasn't here at that particular point. Um, I do know that we we pull a great deal from our Sunday school program. We pull from uh, Tara Wolf, who is our youth and children's ministry director here. We use a lot of her information. Um, she actually has been doing uh, Lent uh, devotions with us with the idea that we would take these things back to our classrooms and use them in the classroom. So we really try to connect it together that way. Creative curriculum is a very nice curriculum in that it allows for a lot of flexibility. So it isn't as though we're following a lesson plan every single week. It's somewhat like having a um, general um, philosophy foundation. And then we build on top of that. So we can tailor it a little bit more um, to what our children and families need. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, so prayers done by students at Bible story time um, is one, one way that we're intentional about um, having um, prayer in our classrooms. Um, we have a birthday crown and another time for a special prayer um, with every child on every birthday. And we do, we even celebrate summer birthdays here. Um, all the classrooms do it a little bit differently. Some do like a big birthday celebration at the end of the year um, for all the summer birthdays, and some people do half birthdays. So we'll have some kids who come in and say, it's my half birthday today, and so we'll celebrate that. Um, this is one little girl, and again, this wasn't taken too long ago, <laughs> but um, they come to the office and they get a birthday crown, and then we um, say a special prayer with them in the office. Um, again, bringing back... Um, the love of, of 
Jesus to them as much as we can and in as many everyday um, celebrations as we can. Um, another thing that we have done um, in creating that culture of valuing children is we have um, what we call Child of God Sunday um, at King of Glory. And for Child of God Sunday, we create a banner in the preschool. The banner is on the left, and all of those different um, sections, it, it's supposed to kind of look like stained glass behind a cross. And every one of these sections was done by a different group of children in the school. So I don't know this for sure, but this section may have been done by all the kindergartners. And then off to the side of it, so these pictures are off to the side of this section, are the children in that classroom. And again, it happens to be my, to be my classroom. This was my very first year of teaching. I know all of these kids, they're all in like third grade now. But um, that we do this every single year. And a lot of that is just building that culture, that undercurrent of valuing every single child as being a part of our classroom and being a part of our school. And um, if you listen to Pastor Harmon's webinar last week, being a part of the entire church that we have. So this is another way that we represent that um, within our classrooms, or within our school, I'm sorry. Um, we also understand that there are um, a definite way to, um, to involve families, not just in coming in to volunteer or to be a part of a parent-teacher conference, but we want to involve them in fun things also. So these are some of the special days that we do um, throughout the year. So we have a mom's day, a grandparent's day, and a dad's day. Um, and we also use kind of the connection with the church as we have church members who come in as surrogates. So a lot of times, especially grandparents, can't make it into town. They might live out of town. Um, they may have passed away. There's lots of different situations, and so we'll have somebody kind of step in for them. As well as we're in a big military area here. We have several uh, bases close to us, and a lot of dads are out, um, and moms, but <laughs> here it tends to be more dads who are out um, serving their country and so cannot be there for Dad's Day. And so we'll have people from the um, larger King of Glory Church come in and be with the children. A lot of times the kids know these people. It could be someone that they're close with within the church environment, but sometimes they don't. And it's really, it's such an amazing connection that they have. Um, and I was very leery of this when I first came here because I thought, well, you know, it's not their grandparent. How could they possibly have a connection with this person? Um, but it really is. It's a beautiful way of connecting them together. <coughs> I am sorry again. Um, and then we really try to involve families in lots of ways in the larger category um, family that we have. So we send them invitations to worship, parent-teacher conferences that we have twice a year, um, our annual parent workshops. And this year we're doing, we did an extended um, six-week kind of class, but it was once, it was one hour a week on, uh, it was Jesus on parenting. And we had two, um, again, people from the church who led this for us. Um, and it was a, a big success. We had about 10, 10 to 12 parents who showed up every week. We provided child care and, um, again, another way to connect them to the, to the bigger church. And then we have lots of different activities that we do. All the classrooms are a little bit different. Um, we have children here that are, that are only here two days a week. And then we have children who are here five days a week. And they're here for six hours a day. So depending on the classroom you're in, you're going to have a different level of activity, activities that um, that classroom will put together. Um, I know we have a little bit of time left, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer any of those for you. What kind of activities in the classroom? I think that's what you mean as far as activities for families. Um, we do lots of different things. So some of our, it really is hugely um, varied on the teacher and on the amount of time that their children are here. But a couple of the examples are um, we have the library van who comes um, once a month. 
and we'll have parents come in and do um, and be our special library helper to help the kids go out to the library and um, and do and um, check out books and just be a, an extra set of hands. So it's small things like that that's really a win-win for the teacher and the parent being involved to larger things like Christmas parties um, and being a part of that. Um, so it really, it really does um, change. We have some teachers who really love to cook in their classroom and they like to have extra hands. And we also have, um, we also have um, some teachers who involve parents more and more depending on what their strengths are. So I had a parent come in who played the violin and she came in and gave a concert. Um, so it really, there's, just, there's a million examples that we could talk about. Our teachers do still pray. Pastor Harmon talked about that last week a little bit in doing our connection, but we do pray at the beginning of every single day. Um, and part of that prayer is um, praying for our time with the children, praying for the children who are coming into our school and in our greater community. There's times when there are individual families, um, children or teachers that we pray for. So we do um, still do that before we open our classroom doors every day. Yes, the parents do know that that's what we do. Um, we had a, um, we've had several parents who ask us about that because we literally have our doors closed. <laughs> um, and then after we pray, we open the doors and welcome the children. So the, te the parents can see us. You know, there's little windows in the doors and they can see what we're doing through there. But that certainly sets a tone of prayer being important. Um, being a part of our everyday ritual, it is not something that we ever say, oh, we ran out of time, we have to open the doors. We just open the doors late. <laughs> we, we try to be aware of that. But it really is something that's very important and built into the culture here. You know, special baptismal events, we have not, but I was reading somewhere in some sort of um, um, email chain of people who have done some special baptismal events um, during their preschool chapel time, which I think is a great idea. Um, we have not done that so far, but I think that's a good um, it's a good practice to to try out. Um, if you guys have any other questions, I'm not sure how they get my email. I can give it to you, um, but it's m dot clawberg which is cl i guess i could type it hold on let me type it down here so you guys can see it so you don't have to oh and i spelled it wrong there's not an l at the end of it's k-o-g-v-a dot org no l <coughs> So if you have any questions or want resources on Pocket, I would not at all, I did kind of neglect to say this part, <laughs> it was not an easy transition for our teachers to start doing this, doc, this level of documentation. It was a lot. Um, and it was a, we spent a long time talking them through how to set up systems to help themselves so that it didn't take up a huge amount of time of their day. So we really, um, I think that throughout the course of several um, years of working together, we've developed lots of different systems to help them with that documentation. So if you ever think of going that direction, even if you're not using Pocket and you're using some sort of other documentation strategy, it's something to definitely bring on slowly um, and with a lot of support um, from the office staff because they need um, some systems in place to make it go as smooth as possible. Let's see, Judy's typing. Oh. Um, our parents, first, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> having a, um, I feel incredibly blessed. Um, our, our, all of our staff, all of the pastors that we have, our associate pastor, our executive pastor, um, our Tara, who is our youth and ministries director, are amazing support to us in the school. And I understand that's not always the case. Um, it is, it, it would, I don't know how you can do it without that support. Um, but, <laughs> and doing the, 
and really if the preaching, the senior preaching pastor, as Pastor Harmon called it last week, is the one who's talking about it and is expressing um, his knowledge of the school, his involvement in the school, um, is, it's amazing how much that helps a congregation um, to really be able to understand that value. Um, we live in Williamsburg, Virginia, and there's a huge amount of um, retired folks here who have forgotten or never cared as much about that early childhood field and the preschool section. Um, and so it really has taken, you know, it's taken that culture to really help us grow. Um, our school is in the same building with the church. Um, I can walk out my office and go left and be in Pastor Harmon's office in 30 seconds. Um, our parents really, really do appreciate the documentation. I think if we gave it to them without any explanation, they would um, find it overwhelming. It's a lot of information. But we really do talk them through it and have them see it. They care the most. I know everybody will be surprised about this, but they care the most about the pictures of their child. Um, and it could show absolutely nothing of value as far as the checklist goes, but I still show just cute pictures. <laughs> a couple of kids playing together, somebody dressed up in a, you know, Cinderella dress. You know, I still show those just fun photos. Um, I can make them fit into the checklist um, fairly well. But um, a lot of times they just want to see what their children are experiencing every day. But we have found that our parents really do appreciate it. Several of them will take that with them and show it to their kindergarten teacher, which is what we tell them to do, um, to show them a little bit about their child. Um, do you use social media with your center photos? Up to, um, we do use some social media. Um, we're getting better and better at it. Um, and having me as a new director, I'm trying to set up some new systems. So we're trying to um, use that. We always have to be a little bit aware of how families, a lot of families do not want their children, children's pictures out there posted. So a lot of times we'll take pictures that have children in them, but you can't tell who the children are. We never use their names, um, but we'll show events that are happening or an experiment that happened. And we, we're getting better at it. I wouldn't say we're great at it, but um, we really try to. We try to. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to talk with you or you can email me. Thank you, Michelle. Great uh, presentation, great webinar, great things happening at King of Glory Early Childhood Center. We pray Thank for your you. continued blessing on your ministry. And let's stay in touch with uh, Michelle, and uh, we're connected with you. Stay in touch with one another. Thank you all for your participants, for your questions. Uh, we grow a lot by sharing, don't we, Michelle? Yes, and, we do. Uh, God bless you, and thank you so much again. Thank you. This concludes our webinar. You'll be able to find that sure. on the the uh, web the webinar on luthed.org. Our next webinar is scheduled for April 2nd, beginning at 4 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. God bless. Have a good week.